Hello again. This is Barry Chase, uh, the senior partner at Chase Lawyers. And this is part two of our presentation on having your own record label, whether you're an artist or uh, an owner of a label that needs to sign artists. We're going to be going through some of the documents that you'll need to be familiar with and need to make sure are done correctly in order to own the music that your company is going to pay for and produce. If you haven't seen part one, I recommend that you go back and uh, go through that because some of the terms uh, have been defined there and you'll see how we get to the point of the documents we're gonna be discussing. So stay tuned and we're gonna dive in with a rendition of the most complicated document, which is gonna be the 360 Artist Agreement. So we're gonna talk about the 360 deal at this point, which is the basic contract between a label and any artist these days. And you should have one even if you're the only artist for your own label, because that's an important element of keeping the affairs of the company separate from your affairs as a normal human being. And that will assure that the company is treated as a separate entity. So let's get into the 360 deal. Now these, these uh, you may remember that the reason for the name 360 is that it means the label takes a piece of all of the revenue that its successful artists begin to gather in, whether that's from recorded music or live concerts or merchandise or uh, a, a, an endorsement that the, uh, that the artist may do or even a movie role that the artist may be in, it means that the company is going to share in the revenue that is generated from all those things. So let's get into some of the important things about a 360 deal um, that you should know about. First, exclusivity, which is at the heart of any recording contract. What I mean by exclusivity is that if you have an artist, you want to be sure that for the period of the term, which is usually defined term meaning the duration of the, the relationship between the artist and the company, that you wanna make sure that the artist is exclusively working for your company during that time period. Obviously, you don't want the artist recording an album for you that you've paid, let's say, a couple of hundred thousand dollars to record and then go down the street and record as well for someone else so that they can compete with what you've just spent $200,000 on. So exclusivity becomes very important and it is a hard and fast rule in the recording business. Um, and again, even if it's your own company and you're the only artist, you should sign a clause like this in your 360 deal. Uh, now, beyond that, um, there, the, art, the um, deal is gonna talk about deliverables. And typically these clauses are based, believe it or not, on the old literary agreements uh, and even today's literary agreements where the company, the publisher in that case, would give an advance to a book writer, an author, and then theoretically have a manuscript delivered some months later. And theoretically, because the music agreements were based on those much older literary agreements originally, um, the, the label is saying, okay, here's an advance or here's not an advance, but we'll pay for the recording costs, but you've got to deliver us 12 tracks, 10 tracks, whatever, that are acceptable to us so we can put them into an album and begin marketing them. Now, the, the um, uh, deliverables, therefore, are those 12 tracks. But these days, of course, you don't have the label just you know, saying to you, go ahead and record and deliver it to us. The label is going to have uh, its hands all over your recording sessions and all the rest if it's a decent, responsible label because they're paying for it and because they're going to have to live with the consequences of those recording sessions. So the deliverables clause is something that is also endemic to a 360 deal or really even the old fashioned recording deals. Um, now, again, remember that the, that the uh, defining characteristic of a 360 deal is that the label gets a cut of everything. 
And everything is going to include intellectual property rights, basically the copyright in what you're recording and sometimes even in the composer copyright, we should go back to, to uh, part one of this again, to see that there are separate copyrights between the composer copyright and the sound recording copyright. But be that as it may, the, the label is going to want to own outright the intellectual property rights, that is the copyright, in all the sound recordings called masters in most recording agreements that are produced by you or by your artists. You're gonna own those lock, stock and barrel. So the recording copyright's gonna be purely yours. It's a matter of negotiation between you and an artist who was also a composer, singer, songwriter type, um, as to how much of the composer copyright is going to end up belonging to the company. And that has to do with a lot of factors, like uh, it, will there be a lot of production? If, for example, you're in a, a hip hop context, the artist usually comes in with his or her own lyrics, but there's a lot of production, there's a lot of orchestration that's gotta be done for the lyrics to work over. And in that case, the company, since it's paying for the producer and all the rest, is likely gonna want a piece of the composer copyright as well. So uh, whatever that negotiation works on, it's all about IP ownership, intellectual property ownership. That is at the heart of all these things because that's what's being produced is intellectual property. And just to give you an illustration of that, you can own a Mariah Carey album. You can stick it in your pocket in a CD-ROM or you can own it on your computer. But that doesn't mean you can copy it and sell some of the tracks on it. Somebody else owns the right to do that. That's because they own the intellectual property rights, which give them the right to make copies and sell copies and make money on them. So that's the distinction between a physical property and an intellectual property. Um, now, there are other things that have to be dealt with as well. For example, you as the record label want to make sure that you have the right to transfer the artist's services, which you've got exclusively, remember, for some period of time. You wanna have the right to transfer that in the event that a bigger label comes along and wants to buy into the artist because the artist has been a very big hit in his early tracks that he's done for your label. Um, or because you are the artist and you've done well, you wanna be able to sign with a bigger label if that's uh, something that appeals to you. It depends on the business deal, obviously, whether you wanna do that because then you'll have to share revenue with the label, but the revenue world will be much bigger if it's a big label, if it's a global label, for example. It will be selling in all kinds of markets, whereas perhaps your sort of homemade label that you've created will not have that kind of distribution reach and certainly not that kind of promotion money to make you an even bigger star or make one of your uh, artists an even bigger star. And then finally, just to, to go through these, the main clauses, there's gotta be a suspension and termination language. If your artist turns out to be some, somebody, and this, is, this happens in the music business, who is a 20 year old and whose head is so turned by initial success that he decides that he or she decides that uh, he or she really doesn't have to behave terribly professionally any further and shows up unable to record, for example, in sessions like that, you will want to either suspend the artist for some period of time during which the duration of the agreement is sort of halted, it's stalled during that time, or you might even want to terminate with the artist. Certainly you'll want to terminate with the artist if the artist, let's say, gets into terrible trouble. Well, I shouldn't say certainly, uh, not in the rap context, but you may well want to terminate with the artist if the artist is going to jail for a couple of years. So those are some of the main provisions in a 360. There are many other documents which we're gonna deal with in a few minutes, but the 360 is the sine qua non, the first thing that you have to sign with your artists or even with yourself if you're the artist for your label. Okay. So what are these other documents aside from this all important 360 agreement with your artist or with yourself, between yourself and your own company? Key among them is gonna be something called a work for hire agreement. 
Now, again, work for hire, usually hyphenated. Work for hire has a little bit of urban legend around it, where occasionally we hear that, well, you should never sign a work for hire. And I have to tell you that if you're going to abide by that maxim, you're not going to do much work in the intellectual property industry, including as a musician. Because what a work for hire does is assure that when you've done something, the copyright in it actually belongs to something else or someone else. And we all have the instinct that, of course, someone who creates something will own the something, even if it doesn't have a physical manifestation, he'll own the rights in that something in order to make money on it. That's the whole point, really, of copyright protection. Now, a work for hire, though, says, okay, I am creating something. I'm creating a composition. I'm creating a sound recording. I'm producing a sound recording. Um, I'm creating lyrics for something. Um, you, those will belong to whoever the creator is. That's what the Copyright Act says. It says that in the first instance, the copyright, which means the right to make money, along with other things, belongs to whoever created the item, the intellectual property item that we're talking about. Now, the, the, the only way to get around that is if there is something in a, a document, and that's what a work for hire agreement is, that says, well, no, uh, yes, I created this, but I created it knowing from the beginning that I was creating it for XYZ LLC or for John Smith LLC, um, and that John Smith LLC and not I, the creator, even if it's John Smith, own the intellectual property rights so, so it can make money on this. That's the key. And it is absolutely necessary that you become familiar with this and as the owner of a label, that you have everyone who does any creative work for you, not just the music. If someone creates a logo for you, if someone does some ad copy for you, it all has to be done in a work for hire format so that at the end of the day, John Smith LLC owns all the intellectual property in everything that it needs to own in order to do business. By the way, let me mention, for those of you who are interested in more information on the work for hire agreement, which as I say, is at the heart and soul of being able to work in a cooperative capacity in the music business and record who owns which part of the intellectual property in the music. If you're interested in pursuing that more fully, please go to our YouTube channel. You can search for Chase Lawyers, either with or without a space, um, and you'll find on that uh, site, on that channel in YouTube, um, a lecture, one or more lectures that deal with work for hire agreements. Uh, they really are central to the way you're gonna make money in the music business. Now, one of the other documents that you're going to run into as the owner of a label or as an artist who has set up his or her own label is something called a producer agreement. Now in rap in particular, this is key because producers have a large role in orchestrating the lyrics that a rapper might create. And the producer thereby becomes a sort of co-composer with the rapper since at the end of the day, the melody and the lyrics, the orchestration, every element in a sound recording, every element in a musical composition is going to have to be owned by somebody. Now, the, the, that means that a producer agreement has to include work for higher language so that the producer's work ultimately on the sound recording side, at least, belongs to the label. The, the, the composer copyright we talked a little bit about in terms of the label having a piece of it, but it will originally belong to the composers and the producer will become typically in rap anyway, a co-composer along with the lyricist, that is the rapper. And so you'll have two composers uh, cooperating together and they must sign then what is another document, which is a songwriter split document. And that will lay out who gets what percentage of the composer copyright. Remember we talked about the fact that there are two copyrights. We have a composer copyright, often called the music publishing right, 
And then we have a sound recording copyright, often called the master copyright, because there's a master recording that used to be made. And in the old days, it was the only one with really high quality. Every copy used to suffer a little bit, not in the digital age. Every copy is exactly the same as the last copy. In any event, the producer and the rapper will typically sign a songwriter split. And it might be a 50-50 because the producer has done the orchestration, the rapper has done the lyrics, or it might be another proportion, depending on who really has done what in the process of composing the composition. Now, once you've got that, you do a songwriter split, and then the percentages that you're talking about have to be carried forward to the copyright registration for the composition and also to something called the performing rights organization for each of the composers. Now, without getting you too into the, into the legal weeds here, performing rights organizations were set up again in the early part of the 1900s when a few of the successful Broadway composers noticed that their music was being used all over town in New York uh, these were, this is like 1910, so it's quite a while ago. Um, and they weren't getting paid anything. And they got together, they remember they were successful people, and they hired somebody to go around and tell the various venues in New York that were using music, their music, that it, you, can, you can't do this without a license from Mr. Gershwin or Mr. Berlin or Mr. Carmichael. Uh, there, were, there were very successful songwriters for Broadway shows. And a lot of that music got into the popular culture um, and was used and played and performed all over the place. So uh, when the, uh, the, the demand was made by these composers that they be paid when another venue used their music and people were drinking their drinks and eating their food and doing whatever, in part because they enjoyed the music, there were a few venues that balked. And the, the songwriters decided, well, we're gonna set up an organization uh, to make sure that they can't do this. And if necessary, we're gonna sue people if they don't have a license from us. And that's exactly what happened. There was a lawsuit, the composers won because uh, composer copyright was something that had been recognized for decades already. Um, and the first PRO, the first performing rights organization in the United States the Association of Composers, Authors, and Publishers, American, American Society, ASCAP, A-S-C-A-P, you can look it up, was established really basically to, to put in harness these New York venues, but also eventually uh, any venue in the country. Uh, since then, there's been another one that's come up. It's called BMI, it used to be actually called Broadcast Music Inc. because it was set up by radio stations that didn't like the amount of the royalties that ASCAP was requiring. So in any event, whether you're a BMI or an ASCAP, and there's also uh, one or two other smaller ones in, the, in America, um, only one in every other country, by the way, but we're different. Um, the, these percentages that the songwriters put in the songwriter split sheet uh, have to be reported to the performing rights organization as well as to the copyright office so that the proceeds are divvied up fairly between composers. Remember the performing rights organizations deal only with the composer copyright. They have nothing to do with the sound recording copyright, but they do make money for composers on the composer copyright. So that's why you need a performing rights organization, which will believe it or not, pretty much know all the perf live performances, all the radio and television playing of uh, a composer's work and what have you. So that to use an example I used in part one, which I again recommend you go back and look at, if White Christmas is played um, on a radio station, which it is in December to death, as you know, um, Irving Berlin or whoever owns the composer copyright in White Christmas gets paid every single time, no matter whose version, of the thousand different versions that may be performed because all of those versions were created by Irving Berlin. So that's the way this works on the composer copyright side. Now, after you've settled as the um, uh, record company, 
who owns what percentage of intellectual property rights, you're gonna have other sort of after the fact agreements that you have to be careful about. Now, one of them is a music video agreement. Um, you're gonna hire a producer as the record label owner, you're gonna be the one paying the producer for the music video. And it's a very important kind of decision you've gotta make because a lot of money will get spent, certainly a four figure amount, often a five figure amount, sometimes even a six figure amount, depending on how much money you wanna invest or you're able to invest in a music video. And there are steps that you should take before you select the producer. Those steps are outlined, by the way, in one of our, I actually present this, a three-part video series on our YouTube channel. Again, you can search for Chase Lawyers, either with or without a space. Um, and the, the selection of the producer of your music video has got to be done very carefully. Um, again, go to those three-part series and you'll see why, but there are three elements that must happen in that music video, uh, uh, sorry, in the music video agreement with the producer. First of all, you have to make sure you own the video that, as the record label at the end of the process, which means there has to be work for higher language, which we've discussed previously, so that even though the producer and his videographer uh, own the, in the first instance, would own the uh, material that is recorded because they're actually recording it, and he who makes the image again, remember, owns the image in the first instance. If they're doing it under a work for hire that says your record label is gonna own it because the, that's what the agreement is, that's gotta be, there's gotta be language in the producer agreement, the video producer agreement that says so. You also wanna make sure that there's a confidentiality clause, a, a very important part of this because during the process, the videographer, the music video producers may discover that your artist is a real pain. You don't want them talking about what a pain your artist was in the studio. You don't want them talking about anything that's your business. You wanna stay in control of that. So there has to be a pretty strict confidentiality clause in the document. And then finally, there needs to be a non-compete which can only be enforced for a period of time, but the music video producer will learn a lot about how to set up a record label during this period. And you really don't want him going out there and setting up his own record label based on everything he's learned about your record label. So there's a non-compete element as well. And you need to make sure that those are in your music video agreement so that you end up owning it. The music video producer can't go blabbing around town about what a jerk your artist is, or maybe it's even you. Um, and so that he can't go, he or she or it, can't go out and set up a, a, a separate competing record label six weeks after doing your music video. Now, earlier or early in your experience with your new record label, you're obviously gonna wanna establish a website. You may be selling some of your uh, music on the website. Uh, you want the presence of your company to be announced through your website and all the rest. So you're going to spend some money on a web developer who's going to develop the website for you and is gonna design the website, particularly the interface with users of the website. Now, why do you need a contract with such a person? And it's very similar to the reasons why you need the contract with the music video producer. First of all, you have to own your own website. You have to own the interface. You wanna own the colors that are picked by the designer and all the rest. So there needs to be work for higher language again in the web designer's agreement so that at the end of the day, it is your label and not the web designer, even though he, she, or it has made all these choices that is gonna own the choices that were made. So you, want it, you have to own your own website. Secondly, uh, you wanna make sure that your business uh, is kept confidential. The website developer will learn virtually everything there is to learn about your business. And you don't want the website developer again, blabbing around town about whether you really have the money you say you do, whether you've really got the artist signed, whether again, the artist is a jerk, uh, particularly if it's you. Um, 
or going out and competing with you. So it's, this, it's very similar elements for web design. Now, once you've got the web, uh, once you've got the website set up, you need certain documents on the website and you shouldn't ignore this either. First of all, you need a sometimes called terms and conditions, sometimes called terms of service document on your website. The reason you need this is because it's your contract between you and the users of your website. They must be limited in things like, for example, where can they sue you? If your website is managed out of your uh, business in, uh, in uh, Atlanta or New York or Miami, or LA, you definitely want to be certain that any user from anywhere can't drag you into court. You don't want to have to go and deal with a lawsuit that may occur in Australia. So little things like, where can you sue us? Um, uh, which is unlikely to happen, but not that unlikely if you're a successful record company. You want to make sure that they've got to sue you where you really live so that you don't have to go schlepping around the world defending lawsuits. So uh, that's one good reason to have a terms and conditions document. It also absolves you responsibility for things like outages uh, that your website may experience. That may cause someone some business damage because they can't get to your website when they need to. So there are various things in the contract between you and the users of your website. Those things have to be settled in your favor, you, you, you hope or you try, um, in your terms and conditions document. You also need a privacy policy. And this, this is necessary under the laws of California, under the laws of the European Union, et cetera. And the privacy policies have become more and more complicated. Privacy policies really set out how you can use a user's information. Um, can you sell all the email information that you get, the email address for all your users to a third party? Um, if so, you've got to tell them. You've got to tell the third party in your privacy policy. You've got to tell your user that we may sell your information. And then the user can decide whether or not to use your website. Um, typically, they, they, they say you that you won't sell their information, but... Be that as it may, whatever the terms of the privacy policy are, they have to be laid out and they have to comply with California law, which is fairly tough about how you can use this material. And the European Union regulation, which covers all of Western Europe, um, it was even stricter in the way you can and cannot use information about your uh, users, visitors to your website um, once they've come to your website. So keep in mind that you're going to have to deal with those documents as well, and that those documents have to be done professionally and with great care. Now, just for your information, Chase Lawyers has developed what we call eBooks, which are little seven or 10 page um, essays, more or less, short books, very short books, um, which you can get through in less than half an hour. And they're designed uh, by us at Chase Lawyers to be used by non-lawyers. Um, but it will explain to you what the sort of legal requirements and legal do's and don'ts are in various of these fields. Uh, again, you can find those eBooks. You can find material from us on our YouTube channel. Just search for Chase Lawyers with or without the space. Or you can certainly give us a call at Chase Lawyers. Uh, email us, uh, whatever your concern is. We try to get back to everyone within 24 hours of the time we receive the call. Uh, if someone is you know, traveling on business or what have you, it may take a little while longer, but um, those are resources you can use for more specific information about your own situation. Remember what I'm giving you here uh, on these uh, video essays is essentially legal information. It can't be advice for you because we don't know what your situation is, what your specific situation is. But you can get more information, which will help be helpful to you on all these sources out of Chase Lawyers. And we wish you a lot of luck in setting up and making a lot of money and making a lot of beautiful music on your new label. So if you like this video, hit the thumbs up button below and let us know. 
Also, you can subscribe to the Chase Lawyers YouTube channel for more legal tips for those in the entertainment industry like yourself. And if you have other topics you want us to cover, please let us know in your comments below so that we can help you out in that way too. See you soon.